Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As usual, we have a special guest on our live stream this week. I'll introduce to you later, but I've got a few things to run through, through things that have been in the news you might be interesting, uh, interested in. I've got a little video to play for you as well. But to start off with, let's have a look at a few things that have been in the news this week that caught my attention. There's been a bit of a flurry of stories this week about the uh, basically, the sock puppet charities, the LGBT government funded sock puppet charities. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. The idea of a sock puppet charity is it looks like it's uh, it's one thing, but it's actually the government's got its hand up it and it's making it say what it wants uh, to hear. Now, everyone knows that organizations like the Scottish Trans Alliance are a sock puppet charity. They're paid by the government to say what the government wants them to say, basically. But they seem like they're a grassroots movement representing some sort of independent voice. I'm sure everyone knows that's uh, what goes on. But they're actually sort of caught red-handed at this recently uh, when Shona Robeson, good, uh, government minister, uh, was found to have asked the Scottish Trans Alliance to persuade MSPs of the need for the reform to the Gender Recognition Act. So just play uh, straightforwardly, using a so-called charity to exert political influence within the parliament which is completely out of order, but that's uh, that was what went on there. Now, the Scottish Trans Alliance, let's stay with them for a little while. This hasn't been a news story. This is just something I saw on their social media. I mean, the Scottish Family Party is blocked on Twitter from like, all of these organisations. We've never been rude to them or whatever. They, they just block us all. Um, but we still, you know, we've got other Twitter accounts. We've got other ways of seeing what they're up to. But this is from the social media of the Scottish Trans Alliance. Um, I haven't got the image, actually. I should have got the image to share, but I'll tell you what it says. So there's pictures of the inside of a grocer's shop. And it says, new queer-owned grocery store, Gull's Grocery, opens today in Leith. And it tells you a bit about the owners. And, uh, you know, congratulations, good luck, fabulous, affordable and sustainable adventure. So in other words, if you come under the category of queer, then the Scottish Trans Alliance, a charity that you fund out of your taxes, will promote your business. Even though it's nothing to do with that, that issue at all, they will promote your business on their social media. If you don't come under that uh, that banner of queer, then they won't promote your business. So obviously there's an advantage to you in the in the business world by being on the right side of the taxpayer-funded government so-called charities. Now, I actually um, thought, surely that's not on. Surely a charity can't do that. So I went to the Scottish Charity Commission website and started reporting it. But it said, have you, have you approached the charity? Have you complained to them directly? Well, oh, okay, right, fair enough. So I got the information for them. I've complained to them directly. And I said, this is surely not, you're not on. What are you going to say? Haven't had a reply yet. It's a good few days. So it's in my diary. In about a week's time, if they still haven't replied, I'll maybe phone them up and then complain to the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator and see what they think about that. One last one I saw this week. Uh, LGBT. Youth Scotland, they, they've got a, a thing um, saying, here for you, they run a helpline for, this is particularly they're talking about, you know, transgender young people. They run a helpline to offer emotional support to transgender young people. Although, but hang on a minute, what does this so-called charity spend doing the rest of its time? It spends its time encouraging people down this dangerous road of gender fluidity, and then having encouraged them down it, and the problems are manifesting, they then offer themselves as the solution to it by offering counselling and support. And that they really don't see that there's any contradiction there. Now, the last thing, you might have seen this on our social media, um, the marriage statistics in Scotland, they seem to get published very, very late. The ones for 2020 only came out in January 2022. So there's quite a delay for some reason or other. Maybe it takes them a long time to count them. But in, uh, in 19, uh, sorry, 2019, there were 26,000 marriages in Scotland. In 2020, there were 12,000, 26,000 down to 12,000, which as far as we're concerned with the Scottish Family Party, that's a bit of a disaster. Really, we're promoting marriage. Uh, marriage is a really uh, important institution in society. So it's really taken a knock during the lockdown. Now, we hope that that bounces back uh, immediately to normal levels. That hopefully this year there'll be a big spike with people catching up, and then it will be uh, be back to usual. Hopefully, but it might be the case that the lockdown restrictions have resulted in a change, and maybe some people who decide, oh well, you know, let's 
delay our wedding, maybe we won't bother. So maybe it will have undermined the culture of marriage within Scotland. Let's hope not. But it was quite a shock to see the uh, to see the graph. I say you can maybe you can see it there just falling off at the end in one year. Right, other things to uh, mention: Scottish family party meetings coming up. It'd be great to see if you can make it along. There's quite a few in this list. Uh, the details will go on social media tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow evening we're in Paisley. Uh, Thursday evening uh, there's a meeting in Dumbarton. Uh, I think I'm going to be at that one as well. Monday evening, there's a e meeting in Edinburgh. Wednesday evening next week, there's a meeting in Irvine. We haven't been there before. Uh, Thursday, there's a meeting in Stirling. Then the week after, there's a meeting in Greenock and a meeting in Dundee. So keep an eye on our social media tomorrow and we'll have the full details for those. It would be great to see you. Now, as I always say, you're probably fed up of hearing me say this, uh, the council elections are coming soon. Something new to show you here is one of our leaflets. Uh, we've designed our leaflets. We started putting them together for different candidates. So here's one for Jonathan Richardson. What do you think of that? Okay, tell us in, your, in the comments. Uh, Jonathan is a, a young chap over in uh, East Kilbride. So that's the front page and the back page. They fall together. And then on the inside, uh, we have that. So the leaflets are going to be fairly similar for each candidate, but they write their own bits as well, their own local issues and their own a sort of personal message at the back. They choose their own put, points to put, on, to put on the front cover as well. So that's one of our leaflets. Would you vote for him? I would definitely vote for him. So if you're in a East Kilbride South, you'll be able to do that. So we're going to be putting lots of these leaflets together over the uh, next couple of weeks. If you're interested in being a candidate still, it's not too late. By being a candidate, I mean either someone who has a leaflet designed, gets involved, goes knocking on doors, delivering leaflets, campaigns in the local area, uh, it could be that sort of candidate or the sort of candidate who just puts the name down, fills the form in, hands it in and gives people the opportunity to vote for the Scottish Family Party. Just having the name on the ballot paper uh, alerts people to our existence. They look us up on the Internet and more people find out about us. So if you are interested in being a candidate, email chairman at scottishfamily.org, chairman at scottishfamily.org, and he will uh, tell you what you need to know. So that's it. Right. right, there's one more thing before I introduce our special guest. Now, the other day, uh, I made a video. I, I saw something on the BBC website. It was something like, um, what you didn't learn at school about LGBT History Month or something. And I looked at this article, and it was just terrible. It, it, so it was bizarre, unbelievable, and, and just terrible. And it was on the um, Newsbeat section of the BBC website. Now, I got it in my head that the Newsbeat section was for like teenagers, uh, you know, high school students, teenagers, basically. So I, I made my video on the assumption that this was made for teenagers. And when I finished it, I thought, I, I'll just better check. I'll just go and check the, the letter of that. Is this really the teenager section, the Newsbeat news section? So I went and checked, and it's not. It, it's supposed to be sort of Radio 1 listeners. So it is teenagers. There's people up into, into their 20s as well. So I've made this whole video on the wrong assumption that it was aimed at uh, aimed at teenagers. And it's seven minutes long. And it probably would have taken me about two hours to make. So I got to the end, I thought, oh, well, I can't publish that. What, what a mess. But I thought I could show it on the live stream because I could explain to you uh, that I got that wrong. But you still might be interested to see the absolute rubbish that the BBC was churning out on its website. It's still aimed at young people, some of which will, a lot of which will be teenagers. Um, but it's not just aimed at teenagers. So we will watch this, and then I will introduce our special guest. And off we go. So here we go. I so say comment away during this. I'll maybe reply to some comments as well. History you probably didn't learn at LGBT History Month is with us again. But let's have a look at what the BBC has got lined up to teach our children. So here we are on the BBC website. This is the Newsbeat section, which is the news section I say, for children. Uh, right, the LGBT history you probably didn't learn at school. Well, if the children are in Scotland, there's a fair chance they will have learned this sort of thing in school. Uh, but anyway, if you think we live in an open-minded, sex-positive society now, just wait until you hear what may have been going on 
down the Yorkshire mines in the 1950s. What do you think was going on down the Yorkshire mines in the 1950s? Well, let's just uh, wait and see. We'll get there in a minute. Right, these uh, educational resources, they always start with a standard line, cut and paste. Section 28 was a ban on the promotion of homosexuality in schools, which was introduced in 1988 by Margaret Thatcher's Conservative government. Now, the Conservative Party, the Scottish Conservative Party, they seem oblivious to the fact that these lessons have been used to turn people against their party. But if they haven't got the wit to realise that, well, that's, uh, that's their problem. But it, it really is uh, blatant. Anyway, let's look at uh, what they've got to teach the young people. Even in the 19th century, it's very difficult to talk about gay or lesbian identity, says Harry Cox, associate history professor at the University of Nottingham. It didn't really exist. There wasn't really any such thing. Of course, everyone was still at it. You got that? This is for the, for the children. That's what they need to teach them for LGBT History Week. Everyone was still at it. The existence of molly houses in the 18th century, pubs or coffee houses, although some just think they were brothels, uh, where men would meet is well known. It's just that many men who visited them went back to their wives and families afterwards. People have always challenged gender norms and sexual norms, Professor Cox adds. So you get the idea, uh, you know, sort of homosexual uh, relationships. They were just left, right and centre uh, back in that time. Right, let's look at the next story here. Uh, the Secret Gay Mag. Uh, film and filming magazine doesn't sound very sexy, does it? When it was launched in 1954, gay magazines were strictly under-the-counter affairs. But this publication hid in plain sight on the shelves of UK news agents in the 1950s. If you go through it, for many of us, it will tweak our gay door looking at those 1950s issues because there seem to be more bare-chested men than you'd expect. Here's the picture from the BBC uh, website. Its editorial team was gay. And after the Sexual Offences Act of 1967, when gay sex was decriminalised, in England and Wales, the magazine was able to be more open and feature naked men on the cover. Isn't that wonderful? The way society progressed to the point where gay pornography could be produced and sold in shops. So you've got that, children? What a journey we've been on. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? What a breakthrough for our nation that uh, gay pornography could be sold in shops. Right, what do we uh, get to next now? We've got a uh, right, sex in Yorkshire. Next thing. Um, a study by Dr. Helen Smith at Lincoln University. No, university, university, university. What is going on at universities? Anyway, uh, discovered that working class men in Yorkshire during the 1950s were having sex with each other in fields, behind pubs, at each other's houses, and perhaps most significantly at work. But that just makes it sound like working class men, just, just, I mean, virtually all of them it sounds like, doesn't it? It was just perfectly routine. They were just having sex left, right and centre anywhere and everywhere. What Helen found was that this was acceptable within their communities. Right. Do you believe that for a moment? No. No. I mean, this is just totally incredible. But that's what this uh, academic says many of these men were married many of them had children and their partners knew that they were having sex with other men in the industrial workplace the research concluded that if their actions at work didn't affect their status of the family that sort of thing was all okay don't believe a word of it this is not history this is fantasy um but anyway this is what the bbc wants to teach the children uh, there's a video about transgender issues you can imagine it's just teaches transgender ideology as fact but the special twist on it is it's basically saying that all over the world, transgender ideology was just perfectly normal. But you know what crushed it in lots of parts of the world? Colonialism. It all fits together when you understand from the BBC's perspective. Right, last story. Gender fluid in 1394. 1394, uh, the date, 1394. Right, this is about Eleanor Reichenor, another role model in the glorious history of LGBT rights progress. Right, Eleanor was arrested near St Paul's Cathedral in London in 1394, caught having sex in an alley with a man called John Rigby. What, what a heroine. Eh? Uh, but it was only when they were arrested that police took testimony from the pair that they discovered Eleanor was also called John. Isn't that wonderful? They discovered that Eleanor, or John Reichenor, 
lived this absolutely fantastical life, says Dr. Bengri. Fantastical. I just looked that up. Cambridge English Dictionary. Uh, strange and wonderful was their sort of leading definition. Strange and wonderful. So what a fantastic life. Having sex in alleyways. I mean, just wonderful. A wonderful role model for young people. Sometimes living as a man. Sometimes living as a woman. Sometimes having sex with men. Sometimes having sex with women. Isn't, isn't that just wonderful? Promiscuity. Fantastic. Sometimes being paid for it. Prostitution. So she was promiscuous and a prostitute. Um, just living this completely gender fluid life. Wasn't that just amazing? That even in those days, there were promiscuous people who were also prostitutes. And what an example that is to us today. That was the better part of a thousand years ago. And this was someone that was jumping between gender positions and discussing a wide range of sexual partners. How amazing. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems that as soon as the LGBT badge goes on something, the normal standards of decency and morality go completely out of the window. But this is what the BBC is producing for young people, and I wonder how many schools have been using it in their lessons as well. Quite a few, I would guess. Anyway, let's quick update on what the BBC is up to, that organisation that we fund through what's virtually a tax. Um, but if you want to oppose... This sort of thing, and also to defund the BBC, that's one of our policies, do join the Scottish Family Party. Uh, there's a big pile of uh, envelopes I've, I've seen just this morning, ready to be posted out to new members, our welcome packs. So if you join today before too long, there'll be a welcome pack winging its way to you as well. There's a link below. Goodbye. There we are. So uh, I didn't want that to go completely away. So uh, it is just bizarre, isn't it? The, the thing that struck me again just watching that, is how much of this junk, uh, well, filth as well, just comes straight from universities. So the ed the so-called education budget has been spent on paying people who might have quite unusual values themselves to, to pump out this sort of so-called research and content. Uh, anyway, anyway, um, that's the BBC for you. Right, time for our special guest this evening. Right, may I introduce to you Dr. Lisa Nolland. Welcome, Lisa. Hello. Right, it's great to have you with us. Lisa is the founder of the Marriage, Sex and Culture Group. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Then we can, we can launch into the, the sort of things that you, you deal with. I mean, Lisa is a, an, an expert and a very active campaigner in the areas of, sort of sexuality and uh, relationship, sex education etc. Um, so a lot of experience campaigning in this field, a lot of knowledge as well, a lot of passion as well and enthusiasm, which we're, we're going to hear tonight. So yeah, do you want to tell us about the uh, Marriage, Sex and Culture Group? Certainly. Uh, so it's been going about 15 or so years. Uh, it's a unique group. Uh, uh, we have about mm, three, 400 folks on our mailing list. It's free to come along, uh, sign up. And uh, it's basically, it's two things. One, we collectively, the MSC, we're called the MSC, we collectively do things. But almost more importantly, we empower groups, little groups, including fabulous Scottish Family Party and various other groups, um, so that we're all talking to each other and we're holding hands. Because so much of this uh, fighting against true madness. Um, uh, if one is doing this alone, it's just too too demoralizing. We need each other. So we have various uh, groups. Many of them are Christians. Some of them are not. Um, um, uh, uh, some are activist. Some are more research based. Some do a lot of prayer, uh, fighting against this madness, the, the spiritual stuff um but so we all hold hands we don't all agree on everything no that's the way to kill anything if everyone has to agree with every single whatever no so we come together we are all appalled at the madness of cultural marxism basically and our key front is the pansexual revolution. So I'm a sex historian. I've been tracking this, I know, for about 40 years now. The only thing I've ever gotten wrong is the trans rights movement 
and takeover of the West of the West. I did not see that it would happen as quickly as it did. But sadly, all the other orientations, sexualities, madness, uh, I was yeah. and our group, we were tracking this for a long time. Yeah. That, that, that's fascinating. It's actually quite a coincidence because you're saying, you know, uh, sort of sex, sex historian. Um, and that video I've made, obviously, it was on that topic. I mean, how would you rate the veracity of some of the claims made in that video? You know, oh. the 1950s working class men were, were at it left, right, and center. I mean, behind every every machine in the factory, there was. Uh... I would say, show us your research. Let's see the primary documents. Let's see uh -huh. the primary evidence here. Sorry, your views or your take on this issue isn't really convincing to me. Now, the truth is, there have always been sexual minorities. Always. That is true. Uh, and certainly we know from a number, a number of different independent or um, entities, research-based, we know that is the case. But the claims they're making are, are absurd. And so I would really want to see what, where they are getting their claims from. Where is their primary resources? Yeah, where yeah. are they? I, I tried to track some of it down from the links that were in the article. I got basically nowhere. Uh, with it. it didn't yes. seem to uh, it seemed to be a dead end every alley I went down. So, in terms of the, the development of, over time of these ideologies and the way that they're influencing our society now, I mean, how, how would you summarize the state of play? I mean, what, what's brought us to this point? Uh, what are the main issues there, now? And then there are many, many reasons why we are at this in this pansexual revolution. That is what we are living through at the moment. But may I just go back to the whole BBC aspect? Uh -huh. Because one of the main problems my uh, group, my organization come up against is um, well-meaning, um, uh, at times conservative folk who believe the BBC. See, it's the mainstream media's promotion of some of these ideologies and mythologies that are really, that is one of our main um, obstacles here. So may I, so I have several books here. Sorry, I'm into books. Fire away, fire away. This is a, a wonderful book, The Noble Liar. How, how and why the BBC distorts the news to promote a liberal agenda by Robin Aitken. He's superb and a very measured, but also he helps explain why the BBC has just t been taken over. And the, the one uh, uh, caveat here is, in many ways, this is not liberal anymore. They're progressives. And how I would differentiate that is a liberal believes in a big tent. You have your view, you have the right to have it. I have my view, it's very different from yours. I have the right to hold that. Progressive, on the other hand, says, no, no, no. There's one view that is allowed in the public sphere. And if you don't hold it, please leave. Just get out because you're not only wrong, you're evil. And we can't have evil haters, people who hurt people. Um, see, that's the mentality of the progressives. And in my view, quite a bit of this, what we're getting from the mainstream media is progressive it's not liberal it's yeah. progressive yeah. So we don't even get a chance it's just we're not even allowed to 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 take to, to bat we're not even allowed into the game because yeah. the game has been taken over by by the progressives who have yeah. one view and one view only yeah now, have you read um ah oh, uh, what's it called the, um, uh, the sacred project of american sociology no, who's that? Who's uh, that? Christian that? Smith. It's very oh. interesting. It, it describes exactly what you were saying there within the academic sociology world, which would apply yeah. to to Britain as well. And it is that they've they've got the their mission is to make the world a better place. Yes. So they're not really an academic discipline. No. They're more a political mm -hmm. campaigning thing, and they've yeah. got their idea of how to make the world a better place. Yeah. And the way to do it is by advancing what they believe and crushing. The other yeah. side, whatever, and, and it, you know, as far as they're concerned, they're doing the right thing because oh, yes. that is going to make the world a, a better place. But it's, Correct. but it's not, it's not research. And same with the BBC. I think that their idea 
of what they're doing is that they're educating the public. Correct. Some of the public are a bit ignorant and backwards and bigoted and unenlightened. Correct. But but they're campaigning to improve the nation, to educate the nation and, and to lead us on. <laughs> but right. yes. It, it, no, it's and I think one of the main problems that um, uh, I find and my group, members of my group find is the um, the role of the useful idiot. Now that sounds unkind, but what I mean is um, those who trust the authorities because the authorities would never um, would never lie, would never deceive, would never whatever and. And as you say, they want the best. They believe they are th that they are helping. They are making the world a better, safer, kinder place. So people like me just need to be shut down. Uh -huh. See, they, they, so it's they, they are being sincere. So in terms of those kind of folks, in many ways, um, you can't do a lot with them. What you where you can push back is with those who actually still do care about what's true. And so that's one of the things that my group does a lot is we look at the research, we look at what is actually the case, not what the BBC says is the case. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, particularly what we are concerned about in this whole pansexual revolution um, um, is its, its targeting of children and targeting mm -hmm. of the next generation, their worldviews, their understandings of sex, of relationships, of gender, of masculinity, femininity, etc. And what the progressives often do is they will take bits of truth, of the downsides of the more traditional approach, blow them up, magnify them, and totally ignore the real, the strong, the good, the benefits, the, the strengths of a more yeah. traditional approach. And mm -hmm. so youngsters are, are basically duped. They're, they're misinformed. They're not told the whole story. So for instance, let's say with this comprehensive sexuality education, it sounds so great. The truth is it's um, perhaps one tenth true or accurate and um, maybe four or five tenths, uh, not really, and the rest total lies. But even more importantly is what it doesn't say. It's not comprehensive. It's not mm -hmm. remotely comprehensive. High-risk sex acts, which are now being taught, and Richard, you have fabulous stuff in terms of what our children are being taught. It's being ruled out as if all orifices are equal. All sex acts have equal outcomes. That's absolutely crazy. That And that mm -hmm. is so flat earth in terms of real downsides to all this that our children do not know about and are not being told. So um, for me and for my organization, we're constantly saying, what about the children here? Now, may I uh, flag another wonderful book? Mm -hmm. You're Teaching My Child What? by Miriam Grossman. She's a wonderful, she's a Jewish psychiatrist. She does the science, she's superb. And um, so it's Dr. Miriam Grossman. Um, she's a, a medical doctor and a child and adolescent psycho psychiatrist. May I may I uh, add a further um, uh -huh. little? Yeah. Okay. Right. So this was uh, one of the various interesting exchanges I had. So I was invited to this late night radio interview uh, in a very. So I'm in Bristol. So this is a very. Uh, um, uh, kind of an alternative part of town, as it were, and very late at night, ra raining was dreadful. Uh, so I go into this studio, and I see this kind of trendy forty-something-year-old uh, and a little twenty-year-old who was uh, uh, their uh, PA. And so I come along, thinking we're going to be discussing ABC. We ended up discussing XYZ. It was. A disaster. He walks out at the end, very unhappy with my conservative answers or whatever. And um, I'm thinking, so this is live and on air. And uh, so, uh, so he was obviously not happy with my views. Uh, mm -hmm. And the little 20 something year old turned to me and said, you know, 
I actually agreed with quite a bit of what you said. Well, my mouth dropped open. Uh-huh. And I said, you're kidding. Really? I wasn't even convinced, sounding convincing to myself. So please uh-huh. tell me, what are you, why? And she said, well, one of my friends has herpes. It has been like a game changer in the worst possible way. And the rest of us just want to have a normal relationship with a, a, a with a chap, with a guy. Um, and we can't find any who don't want to do stuff. Uh-huh. So what happened in that little scenario was the 40-year-old who was um, uh, exploring, et cetera, was married and would never try out these ideas, these new ways of exploring your sexuality. The Uh 20-something-year-old, alas, she and her gang had taken the advice Mm -hmm. and they got to pay. And no one was saying, no one was saying to her, I'm sorry, you were given bad advice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, They really really try and have their cake and eat it in the Scottish sex education lessons. Do they present any and every sexual practice as equal? Now, I'm sure that's part of their LGBT inclusive education. So you have to do that. Yeah. And the way I put it crudely is their definition of sex is sticking something in something. I mean, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is. It's all the same. Apart from one that's particularly bad because you can end up getting pregnant from it. So there's a particular disadvantage with that one, but all the others are, are just equal. But then on the other hand, they try and come along, they, oh, you know, some girls are feeling under pressure to do various things. But I wonder why that is. Is it because maybe it's because of pornography? I think, well, maybe it's because of your lessons. Maybe it's because of what you've been teaching them, the way you've been presenting this to them. Um, they, they've been strengthened in the hand of the, mm-hmm. you know, the porn fuel boys demanding mm-hmm. who knows what. Mm-hmm. Because they've, they've normalized it in the lessons, but but then they try and come all responsible. But mm-hmm. when it's girls on the receiving end, mm-hmm. it's, it's funny that when it's boys, I don't know, <laughs> you know, it's on the receiving end, if you like, of this sort of pressure for these sexual acts. Well, that's okay, but as soon as it becomes girls, then, then suddenly they seem to get a bit twitchy about it. But you just mm-hmm. think, can no one see the big picture? That they're just completely contradicting themselves. But like, as you were saying, the actual information about the the relative risks of different acts, different relationship types, whatever, it's just entirely absent. I find it quite interesting sometimes. I'll say to people, uh, or, or that they will hear me say, that stable relationship is most likely between two people who haven't had sex before they get married. Mm-hmm. Um, and they move in together, start having sex, at the point at which they get married, that, that's the formula for the most stable relationship. A lot of people just won't believe it. Because I think they think that's such a big fact. That's such an important big fact that surely we'd all know that if that was true. But it definitely is true, but it's completely alien to people. They never hear it. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, uh, oh, totally. Um, uh, if I may, I will go back to your risks in uh-huh. terms of different sex acts. So one of the things my group does is, again, we look at the research. So this here is um, sexually transmitted infections in England 2020. Now, because of COVID, lockdown, et cetera, um, this is not completely, this is, uh-huh. this is a, a different kind of um, uh, um, situation. I mean, th- these kids were locked down, et cetera. So, but it just in terms of what was able to be um, in terms of the stats here. So we have here, that um, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex, and they're called MSM. So they Mm -hmm. tend to do these, engage in these high-risk sex acts, which uh, in terms of NHS-endorsed sexual health policy or sites, you can just read them. In fact, if people want to email me, I'll send them all the sites because I live on them. I want to know what are young men, whether they're Mm -hmm. gay, straight, bi, whatever, what are they being told, okay? Well... Um, according to this, 83% of all syphilis is with, is has come from MSM, the MSM community. Mm-hmm. 67% of all gonorrhea, and that's increasingly hard to treat, uh, which is a concern. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, from uh, and the Terrence Higgins Trust, we have 41% of new HIV cases. Now, that is from the MSM community. Um, in terms of their uh, off their common kinds of sex practices, again, you can just go on their sites and see what they say, mm-hmm. what they are about. Now, what mm-hmm. they don't give you on this bit of paper is... The percentage in the population, mm-hmm. which is according to the latest ONS, two point nine percent. So less than three percent of the population are involved in these high risk sex acts. Now, mm-hmm. increasingly, and I don't, I'm not trying to get at any particular community. I'm simply saying sex, and this is Miriam Grossman's line as well. No one should be having anything to do with their bottoms and sex because, mm-hmm. of the, uh, because of the medical science. There are various histological, biological, uh, physiological, anatomical reasons yeah. why this is a high-risk sex act. No one should be doing this. And increasingly, mm-hmm. see, young girls are being pressured by their chaps because it is a different experience, a different cessation. And many men really get into that. They, they, it's a different, it's a tighter feeling because the anal sphincter is different from the vaginal, from the vagina. Mm-hmm. Um, but so if the girl gets into this sort of thing, see her, no one's bottom should be receiving anything. So this is not about orientation. This is about bad sex, uh, risky sex acts. So in terms of layers of risks, anal is the worst, then oral, then vaginal. In terms of mm-hmm. how one's body is prepared to, let's say, protect against infection, et cetera. The vagina is by far the safest in terms of, of picking up very dangerous diseases. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe may I make one more uh, comment mm-hmm. about the health stats. Okay. On this little bit of paper, again, on the latest health stats, we find that um, young females are second to MSMs in terms of getting uh, of res- of um, some of these STIs, STDs. They are six times more likely, the 15 to 24 year old category, than 25 up to 60, whatever. See, the younger you start being mm-hmm. sexually active, the more dangerous it is. And again, young girls are not told this. Why? And and good old Miriam here, she tells us, it's because of the the thinness of the female cervix and the whole, that area is vulnerable. Whereas an older woman, this girl, same girl, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, her body is much more able to fight back against infection. She's far Mm -hmm. too vulnerable. But again, is she told this? So this bit of paper here, six times more likely to get something. Young men are young men, teenage men, up to the age of 24, I believe, yes, are three times more likely to be diagnosed with an SDI. So the younger they start being sexually active, the more dangerous it is for their health. Yeah, yeah. In most areas, governments don't hesitate to advise people about what to do. If you look at the lockdowns, for example, I mean, the most drastic advice to avoid but in some cases were, you know, not, not huge risks, I would say. But then when you get into sexuality, it's like a whole new rule book comes out mm-hmm. because, you know, there's ideological campaigners getting mm-hmm. their oar in as well. And, and so it, you can't say, we think you shouldn't do this because that would be homophobic or oppressive mm-hmm. or Victorian or whatever. And so mm-hmm. yeah, a whole different script comes out. And mm-hmm. you, you can't give the advice. I think it's interesting with... Um, with age, HIV as well. Um, again, it's so dominated by ideological campaigners. Mm-hmm. So you get charities like there's an HIV government-funded HIV charity in Scotland, but they're not for for other illnesses. Mm-hmm. So, so what's special about it? normally with the illness, you, you you present the the health advice, and you also would advise people mm-hmm. of what not to do mm-hmm. in a lot of cases as well. But it's like they're just really allergic to doing that. Mm-hmm. Because it's too controversial, mm-hmm. it's taken over by uh, by ideologues, basically. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And also follow the money. For any yeah. of this, I always say to people, follow who is who benefits here. Who benefits? Whereas you see for youngsters, sexually chased youngsters don't make money for some of these groups, for th mm -hmm. some of these activist groups. Whereas if you start getting children sexually active, then, oh, wow, well, we need the antibiotics. We need the abortions. We need the youth services. We need see it's a whole industry around sexual activity. Yeah. And, and so it, it's crazy. But yes. I mean, do you think some of them genuinely believe? I, I don't know if you, you've heard me talking about the bloke who is in charge of the sex education resources in Scotland, who wrote in his PhD dissertation about the need to break down the barrier between childhood and sexuality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, about uh, this is the, the way forward. This is how we're going to progress. Mm -hmm. I mean, are, are there a group of people who do genuinely believe that? They genuinely believe this mm -hmm. in the best interest of mm -hmm. young people for them mm -hmm. to be like sexually experimenting from age. Mm -hmm who knows mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. and that will make them open and uh, tolerant uh, uh, and more likely to have fulfilled and happy lives. Do, I mean, do they genuinely believe that in the teeth of the evidence? But, or is it really that they've got their, their own set of moral values mm -hmm. and they're not going to change the way they behave, even though they might feel a bit guilty about it in the heart of hearts? And the, the way people, the way guilty people act is they either change what they're doing if they're mm -hmm. going to carry on doing the thing that makes people them feel guilty, they want mm -hmm. everyone else to be joining in too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they don't okay. feel bad about it, is that? I think both things are happening simultaneously, depending on where you look. Mm -hmm. I think there are some some um, uh, youth uh, health specialists, sexual health specialists, who really think this is the best we can do for these youngsters. They will. They they are wishing them well. Mm -hmm. Now, in my view, they are totally or no, no, they're not totally, but they they're missing huge bits of information that either they don't know, they have never found out they've they've just trusted the system. I don't know, but they do mean well. But mm -hmm. I think others, um, I think, are far more pragmatic or also they have their own agendas. But perhaps sorry that my third my third book here a lot of what we're talking about here comes from this man, Kinsey, Alfred uh -huh. Kinsey. His, quote, research on child sexuality, which was never replicated, which has never been replicated, but which is the basis for your chap up in Scotland. See, the, it's Kinsey's, quote, uh -huh. research. Um, so he worked with about eight to ten pedophiles who would stopwatch supposedly um, and be masturbating these youngsters from five months up to about 12, 13 years of age, supposedly. Uh, and these children, one little boy, four years of age, had either 24 or 26 orgasms over the course of 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And these pedophiles would, tr would um, time these children. Now, <laughs> Uh, th then the results, okay, so how could you know that you were, they were climaxing, whatever? Well, according to Kinsey, um, it, it, um, there were, they were screaming, fighting the partner, hysterical sobs, etc. I mean, like, these children are being assaulted and uh -huh. responding in that way. Um, but then he goes on to say, but then they wanted more, etc. Now, mm -hmm. what I'd like to come in here with is to say, what people don't know is Kinsey was a masochist. So he needed pain as mm -hmm. part of his sexual climax. So uh, the, uh, Judith Reisman, who's done more on Kinsey than anyone I know, Judith Reisman, R-E-I-S-M-E-N, brilliant woman. Um, uh -huh. She, her thesis, and I think it's correct, is his masochism meant that he interpreted those children's shrieks and cries as a sexual fulfillment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th that's one thing. But perhaps two other things in terms of this child sexuality. One, no other ch um, child development theorist in the 20th century has suggested that sexual activity for children is beneficial. Even B.F. Skinner. Skinner didn't think that. Kinsey's uh -huh. the only one. But the third thing is, using this, quote, never replicated 
research is like using research from rapists, male rapists who have who are raping females um, to 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 explain to the world how female sexuality works. Uh-huh. So yeah. there are so many problems with. But again, Kinsey has been covered. It's oh the research, the research, the research, and it's like. Then again, as we we you know you, your little clip from the BBC, go back to the original mm-hmm. sources here. And uh, in fact, I have Kinsey's book. Didn't bring it down with me, but um, all his tables, all his in quote research, you can read it for yourself. And again, it's never been replicated. So why uh-huh. are we basing an entire um, industry on? never replicated research, which no one else agrees with. So then you have to think something else is going on here. This is an ideological push to sexualize the children. I think the replication issue is much broader than here. uh, Viewers might not be familiar, but there's been what's been called the replication crisis in a lot of areas of social science, psychology, et cetera, where Mm -hmm. the, the experiments that you learn about at university in the textbooks People have tried doing them again and find they just don't work. So, so people have been learning them for generation after generation, but they're just not true. Yeah. Uh, but, mm-hmm. but I mean, in this case is obviously it's even even worse than that. We got a comment here. Uh, um, right, Bruce. Bruce is a, a critical friend. Often comes yeah. in with mm-hmm. a challenging yeah. questions. Right. Uh, not a single mention of condoms or any other form of contraception. I'm not sure contraception would be. Particularly rather, but well, condoms in terms of we're talking about sexually transmitted diseases. How effective are condoms there? Because the message in, in schools, I mean, you would get the mm-hmm. you, you should wear, you should use a condom mm-hmm. to protect from STIs, but how good a solution is that? Okay, C- could I speak to that? Mm-hmm. Okay, right. According to some um, research from the BMJ in 2015, this is among MSMs, so men who have sex with men. Um, condoms were uh, uh, 60 to 3 percent um, effective in terms of the receptive uh, partner not getting HIV, but only 42 percent. Um, effective in terms of them not getting uh, the receptive partner, not getting other STIs. So I think the truth is, and again, I I totally believe in good sex ed for children, totally. And that brings me to my one of my last books here. Questions kids ask about sex and honest answers. So I believe in being very honest with youngsters about what's going on with sex. So um, STI rates, yes, they're, they're high. It's very worrying about that. Um, So condoms, yes, they can help some, but they're not at all. Um, You won't get pregnant and you won't get an STI. That's crazy because some STIs are transferred skin on skin, the area not covered by condoms, um, and any other other form of contraception. Well, condom is the main one that that, um, inhibits the STIs. Well, of course, then the jab, though that has problems. And again, I think my main problem with this is children are taught, are given a false reassurance. Like you'll be safe if you get the jab, use condoms, um, and then you're fine. No, no, Mm -hmm. no. You you will be uh, more safe, but this is not safe um, behaviors. One sex act gone wrong can be a game changer. Like what you did with a boy in a park when you were 12, you're still living with the results when you're 85. Like you never undo that. You don't get rid of some of these viruses. They still stay in your body until you're dead. So I think for me, I would want far more honest sex advice and fine. Mm -hmm. Say you say to your your kids, that's what I used to do when I worked with youngsters. I would be honest with them, but also you give the downsides that kids aren't getting. They are not being told the full truth. Whereas, let's say with smoking, oh wow, the horror stories they they are shown. You know, totally gross lungs that are all diseased and black and just totally gross. If you smoke, that's what your lungs will look like. And so our health professionals are happy to 
you show that. And fair enough, kids should not be smoking. It is hugely damaging for their to their lungs. But say with these SDIs, the they are minimized the damage. And I think I don't think that's fair. So I would want an honest response to that. So thanks, Bruce. Yeah. Fascinating with smoking. I think in the schools, like I say, smoking is straight down the line. Look at smoking, it's really bad for you. It yeah. kill you, your lungs will be a yeah. total mess. Don't yeah. do it. That's yeah. the good. Then it comes to illegal drugs. And it's all, hey, kids, you know, we're not here to tell you what to do. It's up to you to make your decisions. Um, yeah. You know, drink lots of water if you take this one, but you know, you, you, yeah. you, you know, you're big enough to, and it totally changes. Yeah. Uh, the only explanation I've heard is that people associate smoking with like, with your uncool parents yeah. or an older generation. Yeah. Whereas illegal drugs, well, they're obviously cool and trendy, aren't yeah. they? So, uh, so you've got to take a, a different light. Right. Just going back to uh, protection of condoms, as well. You know, if condoms will say ninety nine percent effective at preventing pregnancy, which they're not, well, let's say even if it was that, still over a period of time, the accumulated risk is very significant, indeed. I, I think a really helpful message to society in general and young people is just treat sex as, you know, the baby making thing. So if you do the baby making thing, you, you do that when you're ready to make a baby. Because if you don't, then you might well find you're pregnant mm -hmm. in, in any case. And then, mm -hmm. you know, the consequences of that, as you're saying, are, are pretty serious. Just say hello to um, that Preston journalist. Love the social conservative stance you take. More of a needed interview your colleague, Michael Willis. I saw that. I didn't know that was happening beforehand, but that's great. Yeah, glad you enjoyed talking to Michael. So uh, welcome. Okay. Um, Richard, yes, could I come back? Could, could I come back to the downsides of sexual yes, activity, uh -huh. youngsters? Yes. Okay, that's not at all the only downside. There are huge other downsides for sexually active kids. Mm -hmm. So you know, so the the ones that are trotted out are um, you know pregnancy. Oh, we'll just use a condom or get on the pill the morning after pill. Um, get the jab, um, etc. But but into their STIs, pregnancy, um, depression, um, suicidality, um, huge mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Sexually active kids are at risk in terms of being uh, abused in date the dating rape thing. Uh, far more likely to have that. Um, they don't do as well in school. Uh, they have poor emotional health. Um, mm -hmm. There are huge downsides. Now, there's a Canadian study, and if you're a friend or whoever, I can send that to you. But sexual activity for youngsters is not a boon. That is not, in terms of, you want your youngsters to fly, to do the best in life, but that for them to start being sexually active when they're young is a very bad idea. And yeah. so that's why we are saying, my line is, uh, so sex is big. It's not a little thing. It's big. Sex is fabulous. We love it for if we're Christians or people of faith, we believe that God made it. Uh, number three, sex is fire, particularly for youngsters. And they are not told this. They're not mm -hmm. told the costs that often come yeah. either now or later or both. And sex is for later. So grow up first. You, you have far more de important developmental goals to master. You need to grow yourself up. Your prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until your mid-20s. That's where you weigh risks. You evaluate. You're in the best sense to be able to be wise about your life choices. So young, the younger you are, the less able you are to protect yourself because sex is fire. That's, I guess, that's what that little 20 year old was trying to tell me. Like we followed the advice and yo, this is, it's really bad news. Yeah. It has not yeah. enhanced our life. We're paying yeah. for those, for that bad advice. Yeah. So the advice in school is reflecting the wider understanding in society, isn't it? There's the phrase that education is the means by which a society passes its values onto the next generation. I've always thought in this area, education is the means where a society passes on its lack of values yes. for the next generation. Yeah. So, so I suppose it's, it's going to be very ambitious to expect schools to present information or values or whatever that have really been forgotten in wider society. Because I think, as I said earlier, I think a lot of the facts that we've said about the effects of young and promiscuous sex yeah 
they're really important. They should be that should be mainstream information yeah. to yeah. people, but it's yeah. like willfully excluded. Yeah. Right? The, yeah. the, the, sometimes in the media, I've brought these things up, and other people will be just spouting off all oh, the research says, the research says, the statistics say this, and this will all okay. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks for telling us. Oh, well, you are an expert, aren't you? Then I'll, I'll say something that's you know equally you know, founded on rock solid evidence, but just isn't well known. You suddenly mm -hmm. get the where, where's that come from? Are you sure? Have a, mm -hmm. They get all the skeptical questions mm -hmm. coming out. Just people just mm -hmm. don't believe it, and then they assume mm -hmm. that anyone socially conservative is just just old fashioned and mm -hmm. ignorant behind the times. If if they just understood as well as we did, then they'd uh, mm -hmm. they'd agree mm -hmm. with us. So if we could just explain to them a bit more but as i say that the facts of life are on our side on there I mean, they've declared war on human nature and ultimately you're going to lose if you do that the facts mm -hmm. are on our side so. i mean just go back to to sex education you, you're saying that you, you agree with this i've said mm -hmm. i've taught sex education in my teaching career in the later stages of my career they wouldn't let me anywhere near it uh, sex education uh, they'd rather like cancel all the lessons than let me anywhere near to teach them but I, I you know taught lessons about pornography uh, mm -hmm. uh, and all sorts you know you don't and i found a lot of you you don't particularly need to preach a moral line if you present oh, the yeah. facts about yeah. for marriage for example if you present the facts that's an extremely compelling case and you always hear this line we have to give the young people the information so they can make informed decisions mm -hmm. and that yes please do yes please that's do. Right. just provide mm -hmm. them with all of the information not mm -hmm. just the, uh, mm -hmm. the little bit that suits you mm -hmm. So, what's coming up next? So, what do we need to look out for in the future? What's coming down the downstream to us? Well, I think um, uh, I'm working very closely with our Welsh mums that are mm -hmm. pushing back the the madness of what's going on in terms of this compulsory um, R, um, RSHE in um, sorry RSHE yeah in uh, Wales. And mm -hmm. so they are trying to raise money um, to fight this. Um, uh, in fact, one of the moms get, told me uh, that about two weeks ago, she heard of an incident in a, this is in a class of 10 year olds, where um, an outside group was brought in. And that's always the first issue, like which outside group is brought mm -hmm. in to quote, give this uh, quote unquote, um, high level uh, quality kind of sex education. So um, on the floor were huge, um, it was a vagina and a penis. Mm -hmm. And the children were, these are 10 children who are 10, who uh, were told to, to um, give all the names of these two genitalia to um, shout them out. And someone said, pussy. Uh -huh. And the teacher, so there's a giggle. And then the teacher said, well, write it down. Yes, indeed. Now, that is uh, so um, uh, uh, crazy developmentally. Uh -huh. You are sexualizing these children. Uh -huh. uh, this is, they're not even in puberty. Most of them would not even have uh -huh. entered puberty. You, you are turning the volume up on the sex in terms of the volume of sex you are foregrounding sex for these developmentally mm -hmm. uh, uh, immature children um you are making it a um just a everyday kind of let's just chat about this um you are normalizing sex talk to children yeah. who have again far more important developmental tasks and and, and th this really is child abuse. So uh, the, the, this um, uh, parent was very concerned. Sadly, the parent had not realized there's no taking their child out of this class or these kind of classes anymore. Uh -huh. So they missed the memo. And yeah. again, so well done, Richard. You're trying to raise these issues. Uh, I keep wondering, where is the church? Have all their servers gone down? Have, like, wow. do they not realize what kind of how, how children who are exploring their sexuality are not going to be interested in Bible stories, etc. See, it, you literally do start hooking them. And so many of them have already seen pornography on their phones, etc. Yeah. So we're really hoping that in Wales, we can start some pushback yeah. here. So it's my turn to plug a book now. 
I mean, where's the church? I mean, my my book here, Christians in Politics, that that's, talks about that issue a lot. I think there's various there's, there's various reasons. I think some people in the church got the idea that if you speak out on these controversial issues, it will put people off coming to church. Like they won't come to the carol service if they think you're a radical campaigning group. In other words, they're assuming that like moral goodness is repulsive to people. It doesn't attract people. It repels people. Mm -hmm. And I think once you believe that, well, I mean, what <laughs> you're, you're on a sticky wicket defending that one. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's very, uh, the other thing I get with with some Christians is the idea that okay, how how can I protect my children from it, mm -hmm. or the children in our church? Can we withdraw them? Let's go and meet with the head teacher or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm often saying to people, okay, that's all well and good, but we care about everyone else's children mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. so, and this comes from the top. It comes from the government. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's you know, it's pretty similar in England. It doesn't matter which party you vote for. You get you get pretty well the the, the same thing uh, out of the existing parties. So is it an important enough issue to determine who you're going to vote for in an election? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people think, oh, well, not really, because the, the real politicians don't talk about it. The, the newspapers mm -hmm. don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's not in the election campaign. It's not talked about in the media. Mm -hmm. So it can't really be a proper issue. So I'm going to decide who I vote for based on you know, who knows what else, which probably is a, is a far less important issue for the, uh, for the well-being of the nation mm -hmm. and the future generations. But, uh, but we'll get it. I, I think there's, there's always two sides to these things. The worst things get. In a sense, the easier it is to wake people up mm -hmm. to what's going on. So when the Scottish government does something that's particularly outrageous, part of me thinks, "Oh no," then another part of me thinks, "Oh great, yeah, we're <laughs> going to get we're going to get some new members out of this because some people are going to be so wound up, and mm -hmm. finally they're going to say, i 'I've had mm -hmm. enough. I'm not mm -hmm. voting for them anymore. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving up on them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to join you now. We're going to get behind the, Scot the Scottish Family Party, uh, and that's uh, that's what helps us. That, that's what helps us." Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, there have been lots of very positive comments here. People saying they've appreciated uh, hearing from you, Lisa. So that's great. Our time has flown by as we knew it would. Uh, but you must come back sometime. Thank you. I'd love to. We can, we can have an update and maybe talk about some other topics as well. Thanks to everyone uh, in the chat. Lots of uh, good comments in there. Uh, so remember all the meetings coming up. Have a look on, um, have a look on our social media. Uh, where is it tonight? Where am I going tomorrow night? I'm going to Paisley tomorrow night. Uh, then it's Dumbarton the night after. So it'd be great to see you if you're in uh, in either of those places. So thanks again, Lisa. And thanks, everyone, Thank for watching. Thank you. And uh, see you next week.